Hi, my name is Austin Strom, and this is my presentation on gradient descent algorithms for Burroughs Foster Sign Barrier Centers for the MLT today on uh, July 21st. So this is joint work with Sinho Chui, who is a PhD in the math department, Tyler Maunu, who is a instructor in the math department, and our advisor, Philippe Rigolet, who is a professor in the math department. So today I'm hoping to tell you um, some motivation for our problem. Uh, I'm hoping that you'll learn a little bit about Wasserstein space. And then we're going to get into working on geodesic optimization for Wasserstein barrier centers. And finally, we'll specialize our results to Gaussians and get some uh, concrete consequences. So the motivation for our work has to do with averaging. And the idea is, is that if we want to average data with some geometric structure, such as like images, then the simple pixel-wise average, say, won't necessarily be particularly meaningful. And there is an innovation in around 2011 by Agüero and Carlier, which considered uh, a notion of averaging based on optimal transport called Wasserstein barrier centers, or optimal transport barrier centers, and the remarkable thing is that it's possible to do much more geometrically meaningful uh, averages of complex data such as images as you can see in this photo and it has other applications so the way that we can turn this into a problem is that we're going to encode our images as probability distributions so each image we're going to think of as sampled from a probability distribution p and then we're going to equip the space of probability distributions with a different geometry than the regular uh, L2 geometry, and that will lead to a different notion of average. And like I said, the geometry we're going to use here is the geometry of optimal transport. So just to kind of briefly introduce optimal transport, optimal transport with quadratic cost um, is defined by this formula. So mu and nu here are measures supported on RD. And we're trying to minimize overall couplings with uh, marginals mu and nu uh, the expected squared uh, quadratic distance. And this was actually this problem actually goes back to work of the French mathematician Monge in the 18th century. So on the left hand side here, uh, we have basically some really simple facts about Euclidean averages or means. And the idea with this slide here is to tell you on the right the analogs in Wasserstein space. So if you just look at the left, then what do we have? We have some a fancy way of writing the Euclidean average. So if I have a distribution p, one way to write the average is as the minimizer of this uh, expected squared distance. And then and then hat here is just the empirical version. And we know just from algebra that the expected distance from this empirical mean to the population mean uh, is exactly the variance divided by n. And of course, it's easy to compute the empirical mean. We just take the empirical uh, average. So in Wasserstein space, the analog for the population mean is this barycenter. And this is the definition of it. We just minimize the square distance to a sample from p. And the empirical barycenter is defined analogously. And previous work uh, shows that in some nice cases, this is work with my advisor and um, some other collaborators and I. Um, you can get a parametric rate or a 1 over n rate. And then in other work, it's known that in general, we're going to expect uh, to be suffering from the curse of dimensionality and, and be paying a 1 over d factor. And so in this work, the kind of piece of this table that we're interested in is this last, last one, which is com computability. How can we actually compute the Wasserstein barrier center? And so, like I said, obviously the empirical mean is very easy to compute in Euclidean space, but in Wasserstein space, it's not so not so obvious what to do. So the suggestion from previous work uh, is to use gradient descent. And so in our work, what we want to do is analyze gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent methods for Wasserstein Berry centers. And the way we're going to do this, and I'll present it to you, is by first introducing these methods. Then we're going to develop some general inequalities that allow us to quantify these, these methods. And then we're going to specialize to this case where we're supported on Gaussians. And there we'll actually resolve an open question from the literature. So a bit of background on optimal transport. 
The fundamental theorem of optimal transport is this really remarkable result. Uh, it goes back to the 1980s. One of the important references is Brenier. And it says that if you have two measures with finite second moment and the source measure is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue, then there is a unique optimal pi in the optimal transport problem. And actually it's the law of a deterministic coupling. So it's the, the law of x comma t of x for t some deterministic mapping. And then the really remarkable thing beyond those two facts is that t is actually the gradient of a convex function. And so we have this uh, formula here. And the other thing to know is that we're going to be using this notation grad phi uh, push forward uh, to indicate that we take a measure, we take a sample from measure mu, and then we look at grad phi of that sample. And then in this case, it pushes forward to nu, so it has the law of nu. And one of the remarkable things about optimal transport, especially in the quadratic cost case, is that there is actually a lot more, there's even more structure. And it turns out that it, in many ways it bears uh, resemblance to a Ramanian manifold, even though it, it is not actually a Ramanian manifold. And um, one, one way is that if we, if we can define tangent vectors. So if we take our optimal transport map, which we just defined, then it turns out that essentially the t minus identity is a tangent vector of mu zero. And that tangent space uh, comes with a, uh, um, a metric tensor, you could say, or a norm, which is just the L2 norm with respect to the base measure, mu zero here. Um, one other aspect of, the, uh, of geometry and optimal transport or Wasserstein space is that the geodesics are really easy to understand. So if we have our optimal map from mu0 to mu1, then the W2 geodesic is, the, is just this formula right here. So what this push forward notation again means is that we take a sample from mu0, and then I look at a convex combination of that sample, so 1 minus tx plus uh, little t times big T of x. Um, and then the law of that is the, the measure mu t along the geodesic. So you can see in this left picture here what I'm talking about. And the important fact uh, or consequence of, of this for us uh, is that the uh, Wasserstein gradient of the squared Wasserstein distance um, is, is, is going to be about negative t minus identity. And so this should hopefully be somewhat intuitive because um, if we think of the gradient as the tangent vector pointing in the direction of greatest increase, then we would expect that the gradient of the square distance is just going to point in the negative direction of the, the tangent vector to the geodesic to whatever point you're measuring the square distance from. So the idea being that if I'm at mu0 and I'm measuring the square distance to mu1, then, then the fastest way to get to mu1 is by following the geodesic. So that's the greatest direction, that's the direction of greatest decrease of the, of the squared distance. And so if I go in the opposite direction, I should go in the, grade, the direction of greatest increase. And so now that we have uh, uh, the gradient, uh, we, can, we can easily define what gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent look like. So we have our barycenter functional here, which is just the objective and the minimizing pro minimization problem for the barycenter. And we can write down uh, the gradient descent updates as follows, which is just literally just um, following the, um, uh, like applying the gradient through the, within the integral. And then the stochastic gradient descent updates are even more intuitive in a way. You're essentially just moving. So you get a sample mu t from p at each time step t. And then you just move a little ways along the geodesic towards mu t, okay? So if we want to analyze these methods, uh, then we're gonna we would like to go uh, to something that we do know how to analyze, which is, is some uh, objects in Euclidean optimization. And the typical assumption that we would want to use there is convexity, right? And in our case, actually, we're going to be looking more at something called geodesic convexity because of the fact that there is some non-trivial geometry happening. And so we look at uh, Ramanian optimization, where geodesic convexity is defined quite analogously, analogously, 
uh, analogously to Euclidean optimization, Euclidean convexity, rather, sorry. Um, so in Ramanian optimization, a lot of work has gone to show that if your function is geodesically convex, then many results from Euclidean optimization have clear analogs, and so we can get some good convergence guarantees. Now, the major wrinkle in our work is actually that the barycenter functional is not geodesically convex. Um, this picture shows in the Berez, uh, a Berez geodesic, or really uh, the geodesic for, for between two Gaussians with mean zero. It shows that actually, like in here, the blue line is concave, so it's not anywhere near convex. And in fact, this is really not just a, uh, an aberration, it's related to the basic properties of Wasserstein space and its curvature. So we know that in general, um, for metric spaces, if you have uh, that the barycenter functional is one strongly convex, it's actually equivalent to it being negatively curved. But Wasserstein space uh, has positive curvature. And so in fact, we, we really don't expect the barycenter functional to ever be strongly convex, except in some uh, really, really simple cases. So we go back to Euclidean optimization, and we know that there are actually uh, other assumptions beyond convexity, beyond strong convexity, that allows us to get fast convergence of first order methods. And one collection of assumptions that allows us to do that is, the, is, is are these three. And so the first assumption is smoothness. So that's essentially like an upper uh, bound on the Hessian of your functional maybe. Um, the second condition is a polyak logiasiewicz inequality, or what I'll we'll call a PL inequality, which just says that uh, critical points are optimal, but quantitatively. So it says that if your uh, gradient is uh, small, then you must be close to the optimum. And then the last condition is just a condition that allows you to say, well, if I'm close to the optimum, then uh, in, in objective value, then I must be close to the optimum in distance. Um, and so really the kind of main uh, thrust of our work is to prove analogs of these three guarantees in Voster set in space. And that's how we're going to get our rates of convergence for first order methods for the very center problem. So the first uh, assumption uh, is actually uh, pretty easy to guarantee and it follows basically from the positive curvature of Voster side space. The third assumption, uh, we can get more or less unconditionally uh, under some like, pretty weak conditions. We can get a quantitative quadratic growth condition. And it's the, third, it's the second assumption that is, uh, uh, we, we can only partly uh, fulfill. I'll tell you about those now. So for the, the quadratic growth condition, um, we prove the following theorem here. So we have uh, the assumption that for from your barycenter B star to every element of the support, the the tangent uh, or the transport map is a alpha strongly convex map. And then under that assumption, we get a variance inequality or a quadratic growth, growth inequality, uh, which is basically just proportional to the average uh, strong convexity that you've assumed. And so to kind of like convince you that this isn't a particularly uh, bizarre assumption, um, just remember that what I told you from the fundamental theorem of optimal transport is that we know that just in general, as long as let's say B star has a measure with a density with respect to Lebesgue, then actually the OT map will be the gradient of a convex function. And so in a way, what you can think of this as is just as a, a, a mild strengthening of the assumption that it'll be the gradient of a convex function. We're just saying it'll be the gradient of a strongly convex function for some potentially small strong convexity parameter. And then that will just lead to a potentially small uh, constant in the right-hand side here. And so some remarks on the proof. So it, it's uh, very related to the kind of really important original work on uh, foster stein barry centers by Agwe and Carly in 2011. Um, and also that this strong convexity condition is fundamental as well because it relates to extendable geodesics in foster stein space. So now for the second uh, uh, point here that we wanted to show, which is this PL inequality, uh, we're able to show the following thing, which we call an integrated PL inequality. And as you can see, what it says is, is we essentially get a PL inequality, except it's integrated. Uh, the gradient, the squared gradient term is integrated along the W2 geodesic joining um, the current point B 
to the optimal uh, to the true barycenter B star. And uh, we actually can't turn this into a full PL inequality in the general case as far as we know. So what we do next is we specialize these two general results to the case where P is supported on Gaussians. And um, in particular, we're going to assume without loss of generality that these Gaussians have mean zero. And so in this case, the squared Wasserstein uh, distance has this uh, structure, this form here. And um, this, this case is known as the Burroughs metric um, from a physicist, or the burroughs wasserstein metric, um, or burroughs wasserstein space, and so on. So now we're studying specifically burroughs wasserstein barycenters. And the, I should say that the Burroughs metric has a, has a lot of really, really nice structure as a subset of Wasserstein space, which is what we're going to exploit. So one nice thing, especially in this case, is that we can write down really simple formulas for what the gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent updates look like for Burroughs Wasserstein barycenters. So essentially what they are is just some simple matrix operations um, on your iterate and uh, given, given, given samples from the distribution P. So gradient descent for Burroughs Wasserstein barycenters has been previously studied. It's, uh, it's not something that we originally are studying. And um, they, uh, in one previous work anyways, uh, the authors observed uh, linear convergence of the method and they conjectured that it would uh, converge linearly globally. And so that's actually the, the uh, result we, or the open problem we resolved from the literature. So in specific, our main result is as follows. So we assume that all the covariance matrices of the Gaussians lie in the set S zeta, where it's the set of all things with operator norm no more than one and determinant at least twice zeta. And what we get is in this case, gradient descent will converge uh, linearly. So we're gonna get one minus zeta squared to the T and that stochastic gradient descent achieves uh, basically the optimal rate of estimation parametric rate 1 over n. Um, unfortunately, we do have a large zeta to the fifth factor here. So the method of proof is to basically control our iterates so that we can uh, ensure a PL inequality throughout the optimization trajectory. So this assumption that we made uh, is, was carefully chosen so that we could ensure that the iterates stay in the set, S zeta. Uh, and that is essentially because S zeta is a geodesically convex set with respect to the Wasserstein distance. So the first assumption that the operator norm is no more than one is essentially kind of a normalization assumption. And then the second assumption is, is really one of the, mo the, the, the more critical of the two. And so because it's uh, S zeta is geodesically convex, we know that if we initialize inside S zeta, then gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent will never leave it. So the picture you can, you can see is, is right here. So you imagine that we support P is in blue, and we start at, say, B0, and we start moving along. Then we're never going to exit the orange set. And the important reason, the reason why we care about this is because we can take this integrated PL inequality we had before, uh, and we can, first of all, verify its, con its uh, condition, which we recall was that, that there is a variance inequality operating. So we can get a variance inequality inside this set, and then we can specialize that integrated PL inequality to, um, to, sh to get a full PL inequality for every B in this uh, set S data, so long as P is supported in S data. And so by applying this, uh, uh, this main result here, or this PL inequality here, we're able to derive our main result. So in summary, we found some quantitative tools for analyzing the non-convex uh, Wasserstein barycenter functional, uh, PL inequality and quadratic growth inequalities. We applied them to the Gaussian case uh, to resolve an open problem from Alvarez Esteban et al. 2016. And uh, really this is, uh, can be thought of as an example of uh, non geodesically convex optimization provably working. So some remaining open questions are first to improve the dependence on zeta. Second, um, we notice in the empirical experiments that a form of gradient descent, averaging gradient descent uh, performs better. 
And uh, this is uh, reflective of some work in the literature for Euclidean optimization. And so we are wondering, or rather Ramanian optimization. And so we are wondering if uh, perhaps that uh, would, would be provable. And then lastly, we're kind of curious about optimal transport on other parametric families because the kind of core non-trivial aspect of this work is that uh, we're working on Gaussians. And Gaussians have a very, very special structure in Wasserstein space that are kind of neither too easy nor too hard. And so we're curious about other parametric families because if you were to implement this for, say, a general uh, method, then um, you would suffer from the curse of dimensionality because you'd have to just discretize your distribution. So using a parametric family is a, is a really good idea, but we don't know other parametric families that have uh, anywhere near the kind of structure that Gaussians do. Okay, so thank you for listening, and uh, this is the link to our paper on, on the archive, and uh, please check it out. I'll be in the comments if you uh, have any questions. So thank you very much.